Okay, uh, thanks very much, AJ. Um, so my goal in this uh, lecture is to give a tutorial introduction to approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC. Um, so I'm going to assume that you know nothing about ABC. And looking around the audience, uh, perhaps that's not a very realistic assumption, and maybe you're not the right audience for me. But um, Now, uh, ABC, it's... Uh, really a, a technique for doing approximate Bayesian inferences in cases where you can't compute the likelihood, but where simulation from the model is uh, straightforward. So the idea is that somehow we're going to use simulation from the model as a surrogate for not being able to compute the likelihood. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, first of all, let me say a bit about Bayesian inference as usual. Okay, so in Bayesian inference, as usual, um, you've got some data to be observed, some unknowns, uh, theta say. Uh, you construct a joint model for everything in the problem, the data to be observed and the unknowns. Uh, with that joint model, okay, uh, it has a density, say, uh, we specify that through the marginal on the unknown and uh, the model for the data given the unknown. So the marginal on the unknown, that's of course the prior. Uh, that expresses what you know before observing data. And um, in this joint model, of course, when the observed data comes along, you just condition on it in their joint model. So Bayesian inference, it's inference uh, as conditional probability. And um, of course, we want to summarize the posterior to make Bayesian inferences. We want to do things like calculate probabilities, moments, quantiles, and so on. And that's usually done by uh, Monte Carlo methods, like Markov chain Monte Carlo or sequential Monte Carlo. Um, now, looking at the above, it might seem like it's a pretty basic requirement for doing Bayesian inference that you can compute the likelihood. Okay, you might think, uh, if you can't compute the likelihood, well, that's the end of the road for uh, Bayesian inference and any kind of likelihood-based inference. But that's not actually the case. And as I said, the idea of ABC methods is that we want to um, use simulation from the model as a kind of surrogate for not being able to compute the likelihood. Okay, so as far as I know, the first uh, person to explain what I call the basic ABC idea was uh, Donald Rubin in this Annals of Statistics paper in 1984. He didn't propose the basic ABC idea as a computational algorithm. Uh, rather, he used this basic ABC idea as a way of explaining generatively what Bayes' rule means, okay? So what he said in his paper is, uh, how is the conceptual content of this theorem easily conveyed? This theorem means uh, Bayes' rule. Um, suppose we first draw equally likely values of theta from the prior, then for each draw from the prior, we now generate data from the data model given the parameter value, and suppose you collect together all the simulated data sets that match the observed data, and then all the thetas that generated those uh, matching data simulations. And then it says, formally, this collection of theta values represents the posterior distribution of theta. Okay? So all he's saying is that if you can generate from that joint model here, uh, repeatedly, say you have data which is discrete, he was writing the data as x, I've used y here, but you generate from this joint model repeatedly, you, you keep the simulations from the joint model where y equals the observed y, and then uh, the theta values corresponding to that, those uh, matching simulations, that, that, that they are exact draws from the posterior. Okay? Um, so it's just a way of you know, generatively implementing conditioning you have a whole lot of joint samples from theta y, and then if you, if you just keep the samples where the, the y equals the observed y, that's uh, giving you samples from the posterior for theta. Okay, so here's a little toy example to illustrate the idea. So um, suppose I have a sampling model that just consists of a binomial. So I've got a single observation y, uh, it's binomial n equals 10, uh, probability theta of success on a single trial. And then my prior on theta is uh, uniform, a beta 1, 1. Suppose the observed data is 4. Now, uh, 
in the plot on the left here, um, what I've done is I've generated 100,000 simulations from the model for theta and y, the joint model. Okay? So what we do is first we generate a theta uniformly that's generating from the prior, and then for that theta we generate a, a y. So we have these theta y pairs generated from this joint model. Uh, now we pick out the points where the simulated y equals the observed y. So that's the points in red here, uh, where my simulated y values were equal to the observed y of 4. Um, if I look at the corresponding theta values, they are exact draws from the posterior in this case. Okay? Uh, so here on the right, I've sort of stratified the, the samples according to the value of y. Uh, for y equals 4, this is a histogram of the corresponding theta samples. Uh, that's a histogram of some exact draws from the, from the posterior. Okay? So notice in this procedure, I didn't need to compute the likelihood anywhere. In this toy example, of course, I can compute this uh, binomial likelihood. But all I did in generating that approximate posterior was generate uh, samples from the model and samples from the prior. Okay? So likelihood-based inference and Bayesian inference, it's still possible, even if you can't compute the likelihood, um, if you can simulate from the model. Now, that algorithm I just described, of course, it's not a very practical algorithm. Um, so if you have a continuous uh, um, model for the data, then, of course, you, you, you know, there's probability zero that you will exactly match the observed data. Uh, even if you have discrete data, but the number of possible values is large, the rejection rate becomes astronomical. Um, so the next important idea about basic ABC algorithms is that you're going to replace in that basic ABC idea the idea of getting an exact match for the observed data with just being good enough in terms of a match. So the idea is that now we'll have a distance measure D and a tolerance epsilon and uh, near enough is good enough. So the first uh, authors to put together this particular basic re rejection ABC algorithm were, were, were these authors. Um, so they combined the idea of simulation from the prior, uh, actually use of summary statistics of the data, and the use of a distance and a tolerance for defining a conditioning that's good enough to get approximate posterior samples. So the idea is that we'll generate joint samples of theta y as before, but instead of requiring y equals y obs um, in order to retain a, a theta sample, we're going to retain a theta sample if the distance between the simulated y and the observed y is less than epsilon. Okay. Now, how do you define that distance measure? Um, we usually define that distance measure um, <coughs> in terms of some summary statistics, okay? Um, so and that's a really important aspect of an ABC analysis. So you can imagine if you were in some sort of simple model where you had a sufficient statistic, um, the posterior distribution given the data is the same as the posterior distribution given the sufficient statistic. So um, if you have a, a, an informative about theta statistic uh, for the data, that reduces the dimension uh, that you have to think, the, the, the dimension of the data, and that makes this, this matching in the ABC algorithm much easier to, to implement. Okay, and as I said, in, it's helpful perhaps to think about the case of a sufficient statistic, and if, if you had a sufficient statistic in this algorithm above, and as you let epsilon approach zero, that algorithm is, is exact. Okay? In general, for uh, complicated models, you know, there's no non-trivial minimal sufficient statistic. So um, in practice, people make an approximation when they, they, uh, they define summary statistics that's supposed to contain most or all of the information about theta in the data. Okay, so I thought I'd give you another little toy example, uh, some less trivial examples later.
Uh, this is an example where we have continuous data, okay? So in this toy example, I have a, just a normal location model. So I've got a single data point Y that's normal, mean theta, variance one. I want to make influence on the mean theta, and I have a prior that's normal zero, one. Again, I can repeatedly sample theta Y pairs from the joint model. I generate a theta standard normal. That, for that theta, I generate a Y. So I've got theta Y pairs in blue, the dots in the uh, plot. Now, suppose my observed Y is zero, okay? Now, what would we do in the sort of basic rejection ABC algorithm? Well, there's uh, no need for summary statistics here because my observation is just a scalar. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to, um, instead of requiring simulated Y values to match exactly with the observed Y, we're going to have some sort of uh, window. And, you know, if the simulated Y is close enough to the observed Y in terms of a distance, then I'm going to keep the, the theta samples. So in, in red here, I've got the Y theta pairs where the, theta value, or the Y value is close enough to the observed data. And then that gives me an approximation to the posterior for theta. Okay, so, um, you know, obviously here, uh, my Y is sufficient, right? And if I let epsilon go to zero, that would give me exact draws from the posterior. But the rejection rate for a given number of proposed samples becomes very high. And Monte Carlo variability in any estimate of the posterior becomes a problem, okay? So... Um, in practice, you know, um, there's several considerations about how you choose the, the epsilon, the tolerance. Um, obviously, if, if epsilon goes to infinity, you know, your approximation to the posterior is just the prior. That's pretty uh, useless. But if you let epsilon be very small, um, there's a very high computational burden in generating each sample from the posterior, approximate posterior. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Th yes, there is. Um, and um, I will go on to important sampling-based approaches and things like that later. Yeah. As is, perhaps I should repeat my apology. I think most of the people in the audience are quite knowledgeable about ABC already, but I'm starting from the, from the basics, yeah. So I'll start with simple versions, and then we'll build up the complexity a bit. Okay, so um, what you will have noticed with the basic rejection ABC algorithm is it only requires simulation. It only requires simulations from the model. We don't need to compute the likelihood anywhere. Uh, that's good. <coughs> um, now, what are the practical difficulties in implementing uh, ABC? Well, um, I think I mentioned we need to choose uh, a distance measure for measuring the distance between simulated data sets and the observed. And um, the distance measure is usually defined in a space of summary statistics that's much lower dimensional than the original Y, okay? So we need to find summaries that are easy to deal with in the Monte Carlo algorithm. And uh, those summaries are supposed to contain most of the information about theta. So, and then the distance is defined somehow in the space of the summaries. Uh, we need to choose a tolerance, epsilon. Uh, ABC analyses are generally very sensitive to the choice of that tolerance. And um, because we're making quite a few approximations here, we're approximating conditioning on Y with conditioning on S, and we have a, a distance measure and a, and, and a finite tolerance. Um, you know, you have to think carefully about how you evaluate the usefulness of the ABC answers. And there's a few ways you can do that, which I'll describe later. Uh, I thought it was probably a good time to show you a less trivial example. Um, this example is uh, the, the Ricker model. And the version of this um, model that I'm going to describe here is, uh, was in this paper by uh, Simon Wood. So it's a model used in ecology for the sizes of animal populations. So my notation here, I'm going to have ST is the size of an animal population at time T. And then I have this uh, kind of state space model where uh, this is the, uh, the state uh, model. So um, 
it's describing how the population evolves over time. This, this R is a growth parameter. Um, you have a, a, an environmental noise standard deviation parameter there, sigma. And um, this is uh, describing how the observed data relates to the actual population size. So we're doing some sort of Poisson sampling with a, with, with a rate uh, psi. Okay. And um, <coughs> there's three parameters in this model. The, uh, the, the, the growth parameter, which we're transforming to a log scale, sigma and psi. Okay. And uh, for our priors, we'll use a uniform priors on, uh, actually on the logs of uh, sigma and psi. So these priors were used by, by Wood in his original paper. Okay, now Wood considered this version of the Ricker model in developing actually an alternative to ABC methods, something called synthetic likelihood. And I'll talk about that later. Okay, um, but the motivation here for using likelihood-free methods that Wood had was to uh, facilitate exploration of parts of the parameter space in near chaotic models. So in that model, if you set the environmental noise standard deviation sigma to zero, that mapping that describes the evolution of the state, that's chaotic. And in practice, if the noise parameter sigma is small, um, it's actually pretty hard to do state estimation and apply the usual tools for uh, estimating the likelihood in a, in a state space model. Okay. So his idea was that um, you know, we could perhaps use summary statistics to throw away a certain amount of information and then the, the likelihood would be better behaved in these sort of near chaotic models. Okay. Uh, maybe another secondary motivation here for using summary statistics is that sometimes if, if you think the model's misspecified, it may be helpful only to condition on some summaries that you care about. And, uh, it can be that even if the model for the full data is misspecified, um, the implied model for the summary statistics can be nearly well specified. And so uh, maybe that's another motivation for using ABC in this particular model. Um, so what sort of summary statistics did Wood use in his analysis of this model? He uh, suggested a set of 13 summary statistics. Uh, Auto covariance is to lag five, the sample mean, um, some coefficients of a qubit regression of ordered differences of simulated data um, on order statistics of observed data, um, <coughs> some coefficients of an order regressive model, surrogate model, and the number of zeros. So you have summaries here that capture aspects of the marginal distribution of the data and also uh, summary statistics that are somehow capturing the dependence structure. Okay. Now, for doing ABC in this example, I'm going to reduce Wood's original 13 summary statistics to three, one for each parameter. And I'll describe the, the method that's used for doing that uh, later on. So here is a simulated data set from the model. So log R, log sigma, log psi are these. So we have... Uh, this uh, simulated data. And so I'm going to do ABC for this simulated data and see if we can recover um, <coughs> a, a sensible uh, model. Okay, so here I've just shown what happens when you use rejection ABC. Uh, I used 100,000 prior samples, kept 500, the closest 500 in terms of a certain scaled Euclidean distance. And um, so we have the marginal posteriors for the three parameters. Um, on the diagonal there of that matrix of plots, the, the red is the true value. And uh, on the off diagonal, um, you've got the uh, you know, estimated bivariate posterior marginals by a kernel estimate. OK. Um, so this is an approximate uh, posterior in this example. And uh, we've made a lot of approximations. We've uh, used summary statistics, projected them down to lower dimension, and used a distance and a tolerance. And, um, you might ask, well, how can we, you know, 
validate the usefulness of this approximation by whatever we're doing. So um, here's a very basic validation. It's uh, a start. So here was my observed data. Um, I took the uh, point estimates from the ABC analysis and simulated some data, just plugging in those point estimates. So I have these three simulated data sets. Um, perhaps they're qualitatively similar, similar to the, uh, the original data. Now, <coughs> of course, such a, a simple validation, it's something you should do, but it isn't really adequate. So in an ABC analysis, you're approximating the posterior for observed data or the posterior for given summaries in a certain way. But the approximation error is unknown, okay? Uh, so, you know, you do need some sort of validation of the results. You do need to uh, do some empirical checking. And, um, of course, there's, there's some theory as well that will say that under certain circumstances we get at least uh, posterior consistency or, you know, you may be able to say something about the shape of the posterior distribution as well. So um, one uh, validation method you could use to assess the adequacy of an ABC approximation is similar to what I did on that last slide. You can use some sort of posterior predictive checking. Uh, so in that last slide, I just plugged in a point estimate of the parameters and simulated using that. But I could simulate from the posterior predictive distribution for a replicate and somehow see whether um, you know, aspects of the observed data summarized by some statistic, if those observed values are lying out in the tails of the corresponding posterior predictive. If so, that might cause you to question the adequacy of the model. Um, now, there's some interesting possibilities, actually, for using the, the, the very simplest ABC methods when it comes to validation. Um, you know, the, there are sophisticated, uh, of course, ABC sampling algorithms. But one virtue of, of the simple ABC methods that do just things like rejection or, or simple important sampling is that they really allow you to easily do reanalyses for different data sets using the same prior samples, OK? So in other words, you can do things like you can take some of the prior samples that you generated, and then you can um, pretend you don't know the corresponding theta. You can do an ABC analysis. Uh, you can see how well, in some sense, you are estimating um, the, the, uh, the parameter values that you left out, okay? Um, <coughs> so, you know, this kind of uh, idea has a lot of applications for, for example, you could try and choose the tolerance in an optimal way using those sorts of ideas. You can explore frequentist properties of, of the posterior. Um, and you can also use these sort of simulations from the prior to check the reasonableness of the prior as well. Um, if there's prior data conflict, you can probably, um, and that by that I mean if, if the prior is putting all its weight out in the tails of the likelihood, you, you, can, you can detect that sort of thing easily with, with uh, the sort of prior replicates that you get here uh, that come for free with the ABC analysis. Um, another perhaps, you know, as well as checking sort of frequentist properties of ABC inferences, there are also sort of more Bayesian ways that you can uh, check the adequacy of the ABC posterior. So you might know that Bayesian credible intervals, they have a kind of coverage property under repeated sampling from the prior. So in other words, um, you know, suppose you repeatedly generate a theta from the prior, then some data, and then for each of those um, samples, you compute, say, 95% uh, posterior credible interval. Now, um, those 95% posterior credible intervals under repeated sampling from the prior, they should contain the corresponding true parameter values 95% of the time. Now, that's not exactly a frequentist property. A frequentist, uh, frequentist coverage requires the uh, 
the, the coverage to match the nominal for any theta in the parameter space. Here we're just saying that under repeated sampling from the prior, we have that kind of coverage property. And uh, one way that people have suggested uh, we should validate ABC approximations is using this idea. So you, you uh, do repeated ABC analyses where you're sampling from the prior. As I said, these repeated analyses are, are simple to do with some ABC algorithms. And then you, uh, you check if your ABC posterior is sort of a proper Bayesian posterior in this sense of having this coverage property under repeated sampling from the prior. Um, of course, you can try and compare results for different likelihood-free computational methods. Um, and when they disagree, well, <coughs> perhaps you have some insight into which might be trusted more. Um, there are theoretical validations, of course, of ABC methods in an asymptotic sense. Hopefully, um, you know, that you have at least some kind of posterior consistency property. And perhaps you can say more than that about the, the shape of the posterior asymptotically. Um, right. Now, I want to say some more now about summary statistics for ABC, how you choose summary statistics. Uh, what are the, some of the considerations involved in choosing good summary statistics for ABC? So one of the most consequential assumptions you make in ABC is actually this, this one here, that conditioning on um, the observed Y is approximately the same as conditioning on some summary statistics S. Um, so we want to, you know, if S was a sufficient statistic, then um, I guess um, this would be a quality if I could um, make my tolerance vanishingly small. Um, so, you know, you might think naively that um, to make this approximation reasonable, well, we should make our summary statistics uh, capture as much information about theta in Y. And so um, we, should make, um, we should make the summary statistics high dimensional. Right? We should uh, get them to capture as much information as possible. So um, outside, you know, non-trivial kind of models. There's no minimal sufficient, no, there's no non-trivial minimal sufficient statistic. So uh, you might think, well, just make the summary statistics as high dimensional as possible to capture as much information as we can. Um, well, that's, that's not really good advice because, um, well, while high dimensional summaries, that might make that approximation more reasonable, um, you know, when you consider Monte Carlo algorithms, high dimensional summaries are much harder to match. So if you can only simulate a given number of simulations from the model, if you can only, uh, you have a limited computational budget that way, if you have a high dimensional summary, then, you know, you may have to have a, a less stringent tolerance. And so that, that ABC approximation is, is worse um, for that reason. So, um, there are these competing uh, statistical and computational considerations that you have to consider when you construct summary statistics. Uh, generally, it's recommended that <coughs> you try and make the dimension of the summary statistic of the same, uh, uh, well, you make it of the same dimension as the, uh, the parameter. So very commonly, people start off with uh, a bunch of candidate summary statistics that are sort of chosen on intuitive grounds, and then they'll try and uh, do some sort of dimension reduction to get a summary statistic that's of minimal dimension, which makes the Monte Carlo aspect of the ABC uh, tractable. So here's a, an example <coughs> going back to that Ricker model that I talked about earlier. Um, so as I said, in Wood's original paper, um, he had a set of 13 summary statistics. Now that was fine for what he was doing because he was not using ABC. He was using a method called synthetic likelihood that I'll describe later. But for ABC, um, if you use a 13 dimensional summary statistic, you get uh, very poor approximations to the true posterior. Okay, so um, 
This plot shows uh, results from two ABC analyses. Uh, so the green points are an analysis based on a three-dimensional uh, summary statistic. Um, and that three-dimensional summary statistic was constructed by taking the original 13-dimensional summary statistic and somehow using regression to project down to three dimensions. So um, the particular projection method used here is due to Fernhead and Prangle, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, the points shown in black here, they're approximate posterior samples for ABC obtained from the original 13-dimensional summary statistic. And um, so here we've used the same number of uh, simulations from the model for the two methods. I think uh, 100,000 simulations where I kept 1% uh, or something. And um, actually, if you looked at the approximation based on the 13-dimensional summary here, you'd find that the posteriors are actually pretty close to the prior, okay? So, um, so for a given computational budget, you know, if you use high dimensional summaries, that may result in a poor approximation, okay? And this is the case in this particular example. Um, now, sometimes I see people writing in the ABC literature that, you know, um, the summary statistic problem is not yet solved, okay? And that's certainly true, but um, I don't think it'll ever be solved. I don't think you can ever completely automate summary statistic choice uh, for a few reasons. One of the main reasons is that um, sometimes the choice of summary statistics, it can be motivated by concerns of model misspecification. And that's very much uh, problem specific, I think. Um, I think I mentioned before that um, ABC, in a sense, is quite nice for dealing with uh, possibly misspecified models. Even if your model for the full data Y is not correctly specified, um, a model for summary statistics sometimes can be nearly well specified. If you look at the implied uh, model for the summary statistics from the full data model. And in a given application, you know, matching summaries you care about makes sense, okay, depending on what you're going to use the model for. Um, <coughs> now, a point I'd like to make is that, um, as in other computational algorithms for Bayesian inference, modeling problems lead to computational problems, okay? And what I mean is, if the model is misspecified, it can be difficult to basically match the observed summary statistics um, under simulation for any value of the parameter at all, okay? So that's what it means when, a, when you say a model fits poorly. It means that, that, that you know, the, the data is surprising under any value you might specify for the model parameters. Um, so you, you get this situation where it can be difficult to match simultaneously inconsistent subsets of summaries under the model. And that means um, you'll get a large tolerance being required for a given computational effort and you'll get very poor approximations. So here's a little example, another toy example that illustrates that particular point. So this example was in this uh, book chapter in the recently released handbook of ABC by, in this chapter by Sisson, Fan and Beaumont. Um, so what we're going to he do here is just consider a simple uh, sample from a Poisson model. <coughs> so I've got um, the data is Y. Um, I have five IID draws from a Poisson model with mean lambda. My prior on lambda is a gamma 1, 1. Suppose my observed data consists of four zeros and a five. And... Um, you know, I'm going to pretend that I, the likelihood's intractable and I didn't really know that there was a minimal sufficient statistic. And so we're going to consider summary statistics that are based on um, the sample mean Y bar and the sample variance S squared. So for this data, um, the sample mean is 1 and the sample variance is 5. <coughs> now... Because this is a Poisson model, so you know that the sample mean is a minimal sufficient statistic. 
Okay? Um, so that would somehow be the ideal choice for ABC summary statistics, you would think. Now, one way that people approach a summary statistic choice is they start with, you know, a set of intuitive summary statistics and they'll, they'll look at adding one summary statistic at a time until the posterior doesn't change much, right? So if you had a sufficient statistic and you added another statistic to it, that's, you've still got something that's suffi sufficient, right? It's not minimal sufficient, but the posterior shouldn't change, right? So you might think, well, okay, we'll just add in summary statistics one at a time until um, the posterior doesn't change any much, t doesn't change much, and then uh, we we're done. Um, so this example sort of illustrates the dangers of such an approach. So here we know the true posterior, that's shown in black, okay, that's a, that's a gamma distribution. Um, now, the ABC, an ABC posterior based on the sample mean Y bar as a summary, that's given by the purple line there, okay? So that's a, that's a good approximation. And, uh, you know, as I said, that's sort of the ideal summary statistic here. Uh, y bar is a minimal sufficient statistic, and it's of the same dimension as the parameter. Uh, but what happens when we add in another summary statistic? What happens when we look at both the mean and the variance? Uh, well, you get this, okay? Why is that? Um, so the, the ABC approximations, I should say here, they're based on the same number of uh, prior samples. Now, the posterior, of course, is the same when you add in S squared as an additional component of the summary statistic. But why do we get this, this terrible approximation? Well, it's because if you look at the observed value of y bar and s squared, um, th this is a very unusual value under the model, no matter what value of theta you choose, okay? Um, so in a Poisson model, of course, the mean and the variance are the same. So here we've got a mean and a variance that are somehow quite different, okay? And so these summary statistics are somehow inconsistent with each other under the model. They're bringing conflicting information and that means that when you simulate from the model and you, you keep the theta and y samples that get close to this, well, if you're choosing the tolerance adaptively to, to choose a fixed number of samples out of a fixed number of prior simulations, you have to use a very large tolerance and you get a very poor approximation, okay? Um, so if I was following a strategy for choosing summary statistics, of starting out small, I start with y bar, and then I'm going to add summary statistics till nothing changes. Well, I add in S squared. Okay, uh, it, it changes in a big way, but, but you know, that, that new summary statistic component that I added, it's not actually very useful. Here. Now, if I do the ABC approximation just on the variance, I get, I get this approximation here, okay? And, of course, if I use just the variance, well, as I said, in a Poisson model, the variance is, is lambda, right? So unsurprisingly, my posterior approximation there is, is uh, centered around that sort of estimate of lambda. Yeah? You need to, to increase the number of samples a lot to get the red curve to match with the black one? Yeah, yes, you would need to. And it's because the, the model fits poorly, so um, that value of one and five, it, it's just way out in the tails of the, of the data model, no matter what theta you choose. So, you know, you have to just simulate an enormous number of times just to get close. And so, if you only simulate a fixed number of times, and then you just choose the closest, they're still very far away. And so that's the problem, yeah. So you're right, you'd, you'd need to simulate a lot of samples to, to be able to recover that, that true posterior. Um, okay, so let me say a bit more about uh, summary statistic choice. So I've, I've sort of mentioned that it's important to, um, in ABC, to reduce the dimension as much as possible, um, just because, it, it, you know, for high dimensional summary statistics, it's harder to match them. Um, <coughs> so there are various kinds of uh, methods for choosing summary statistics from a given candidate set of summaries. Um, 
So there were some early approaches that sort of do subset selection somehow. Um, there are projection methods um, such as regression sort of based projection methods like partial least squares, neural nets, uh, some decision theoretic approaches based on optimal point estimation. I'll explain this method a bit more in a minute. Um, and, you know, there's, there's also regularization methods which use shrinkage in conjunction with regression adjustments. Okay, uh, so let me explain one approach you can use to project down a high dimensional set of summary statistics to low dimension. Uh, so this is the method that I used for that Ricker model example. And this method is due to Fernhead and Prangle. So they had some sort of justification for this in terms of getting a posterior where the point estimation is optimal in terms of uh, mean squared error. Um, so suppose we have a set of candidate summary statistics U. So this could be possibly quite high dimensional. Um, and then first of all, we, for a pilot ABC run, we try and determine a region of approximate posterior support. Um, so you try and truncate to a smaller region. And in particular, that makes it easier to get uh, regression models that fit well within the, the smaller localized region. So we simulate um, then theta U samples using the prior truncated to the training region. So if the training region contains the posterior, this truncation of the prior shouldn't have any effect statistically on the estimated posterior. Then um, the way you project the original summaries down to a set of summaries of minimal dimension of the same dimension as theta is you do regression. So for your simulated samples here, you regress each component of theta on the corresponding U values. And then from the fitted regression, you have a fitted value and um, that we, we use those fitted values for the regressions as the summary statistics, essentially. Okay, so the idea is it will fit, what, fit a regression for each parameter in theta, for each component of theta. Then from our regression, we have fitted values for each component, and we're gonna use those fitted values based on the high dimensional covariates U. Those fitted values are gonna be a set of summary statistics of the same dimension as theta, and hopefully that contains most of the original information um, in the high dimensional set of summaries U about, about theta. Um, let me talk about uh, another example. Um, this was also considered in, uh, in Simon Wood's uh, paper about synthetic likelihood. This is an example with a where there's a much higher dimensional set of summary statistics. So for doing ABC, you really do need these projection methods or some sort of dimension reduction. Uh, so here's the data. Uh, it concerns um, uh, the size of a blowfly population. So Nicholson did some experiments with both blowfly uh, populations where he experimented with different feeding regimes. And this time series is from one of his experiments. So uh, Wood and Faziolo and Wood have considered um, a certain model for these data based on discretizing a delayed differential equation model. So they have a sort of stochastic version of this, um, this model that was suggested in this paper. And um, so similar to before, this, this NT is a population size. Uh, that's a sum of a, a recruitment process and an adult survival process uh, the recruitment process, it depends on a sort of growth parameter and a delay parameter. And uh, this ET is some environmental noise with some standard deviation as well that we need to estimate. The adult survival process, um, it's this binomial and we have this parameter delta as well as, again, a, 
a, a sort of noise parameter there that we need to estimate. Um, so, um, so that's, that's the model. Um, this has more parameters in it than previously. So these were the priors that um, we used on the parameters in that model um, by, by Wood. So I'm going to use the same priors here. Uh, Wood suggested for implementing his 20, th for his synthetic likelihood, he suggested a 23 dimensional summary statistic. So again, the sort of summary statistics he considers here are sort of a combination of um, statistics that measure aspects of the marginal distribution and statistics that relate to the dependent structure. So you have auto covariances to lag 11, sample mean, difference of sample mean and median, the number of observed turning points. Uh, again, you can order the um, observed differences for both simulated and observed data and do a cubic regression of the ordered differences on each other to get some coefficients that are summaries for each simulated data set. And we have uh, five coefficients of a certain autoregressive model. So there's some sort of surrogate model with a tractable likelihood where it's thought that the estimated parameters in that model are informative about the dynamics. Yeah. So here is uh, the, an ABC analysis, a simple ABC analysis based on 100,000 prior samples, um, retaining 500 samples. Um, and I use the Fernhead and Prangle summaries here. So they are six dimensional. If you uh, tried to use the original 23 summary statistics in ABC, that would really not be, uh, not be feasible at all. Okay? So the dimension reduction in this particular example is really crucial to making ABC answers uh, reasonable. So here is a, a plot that illustrates the idea of the Fernhead and Prangle summary statistics. So um, after finding some sort of uh, training region based on an ABC pilot run, we restrict the prior to that training region. We've sim simulated um, theta and u pairs from the uh, uh, prior truncated to the training region. And then what we've done is we've done a regression. So there's, we've done uh, a regression for each parameter. Um, so the parameters are on the y-axis here. And um, so in this regression, we've, we've included as covariates the 23-dimensional summary statistic plus some transformations of them to capture some further nonlinearities. And so um, we have six regressions, one for each parameter. And here the plot is showing you the, the fitted values from the regressions versus the, um, the, the parameter values. So the, the fitted values from the regressions become uh, six summary statistics. And these are the summary statistics we used in the ABC analysis. So we went from the 23 dimensional summary statistic to, to six dimensions. And that makes the task, the ABC task of somehow matching the summary statistics a lot easier. Yeah. Now, um, a very common uh, technique that I want to talk about now that also uses regression uh, concerns um, post-processing adjustment of the ABC posterior. Okay, so the original idea was proposed in this paper by uh, Beaumont, Jang and Balding, but the idea has been refined in many different ways by other authors. Um, so when you think about it, in ABC, you're generating from the prior. You're generating theta S samples from the prior. And, um, you know, empirically, if we, if we have a, a data set of response and covariate pairs, we want to estimate a conditional distribution. How do we do that in statistics? Well, the way we estimate the conditional distribution of some response given a covariate is we use regression. Regression is just conditional density estimation, isn't it? So you might think that based on the 
theta and s samples, uh, you could just use regression to get an estimate of the conditional distribution of theta given that the summary statistic s equals the observed value. So how does that help us? Okay. So um, suppose um, I have parameter and summary statistic samples from the model here. Um, I'm just going to consider a linear regression model, okay? So to make things simple, let's just suppose that theta is uh, one-dimensional, it's a scalar. Um, but there's no real complication extending this to multivariate settings. So I've got this linear regression and my, for my covariate, I'm using these values of the simulated summaries minus the observed summary. And I've got some errors, which I'm going to assume here are zero mean IID. Now, um, suppose I fit this uh, model, say by least squares, and then I've got estimates, uh, beta zero hat and beta hat for these parameters here in the mean. Then uh, I could construct empirical estimates of these residuals by just subtracting from the theta values the, the fitted values, okay? So I've got these empirical residuals either I had are theta i minus beta zero hat minus beta hat transpose si minus s ops. Now in this regression, um, what is the fitted value of that regression at s equals s ops? Well, when s equals s ops, this is zero. So the fitted mean value is just beta zero hat. And so if we take this regression model seriously, um, if I wanted to generate a sample of theta values from the posterior, from the conditional distribution of theta given s equals s obs, what I could do is I could just uh, look at the fitted mean plus the empirical residuals. Okay? Remember, the residuals are supposed to be iid for different s. So, um, so, you know, I can just get the empirical residuals from my fit. I can add them on to the fitted mean beta zero hat where s equals s obs. And that, if the regression model was correct, that would give me, you know, approximate posterior samples from theta given s equals s obs. Okay, so that's the idea of regression adjustment. We have um, these adjusted samples, they're the fitted mean values for this regression plus the empirical residuals. Um, so that works out to be this. Um, now you might object at this point, you know, is linear regression really adequate here? And no, it's not. Um, but of course, you, this is a post-processing adjustment that you combine with ABC. So in ABC, you, you, you localize and you can apply this regression adjustment locally. Um, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to get away with a bigger tolerance, okay? You can have a bigger epsilon and the regression will sort of take care of um, the, the, the crudeness of that approximation to some extent, okay? And um, so we can localize in this fitting. We can also consider nonlinear regression models and people do that. Um, you can consider weighting, you can consider multivariate uh, theta. So here's back to my toy example that I talked about at the beginning. So suppose I have this uh, location normal model. So my y is normal theta 1. My prior and the mean theta is normal 0, 1. So I had this uh, kind of uh, plot before. So I generated theta y samples from the prior. And then we said what we'd do is we'd, um, you know, keep the theta samples where the simulated y was close to the observed y. So that's the points in red there. Now, what you do in regression adjustment is the following. Suppose I fitted a regression model to uh, predict theta from y within the window. So I fitted a linear regression just to the red points. Um, what regression adjustment says is that, well, I can look at the fitted value at the observed y, that's, that's this one, and then I can add on to that fitted value the residuals from the regression. So in other words, in terms of this plot, what you're doing is for these red points, you're sliding them parallel to the fitted regression line down to zero or up to zero. 
Um, and that, that results in, in a better approximation to the posterior, at least if your regression model is um, sort of adequate. Okay? So this is a case of combining this linear regression adjustment with, with, with ABC, with a tolerance. And so we're only requiring the linear regression to, to be sort of reasonably valid locally. Um, now, you can, of course, consider more sophisticated regression adjustments. So this is a nonlinear adjustment that's uh, quite popular and available in standard software. So we could consider a regression model now where there's a flexible mean that's a function of the summary statistics plus a flexible standard deviation function times some zero mean variance one residuals. Now suppose I fit that model. Um, so in this model, uh, it was introduced by, uh, in, in this paper here, so in that paper they were parametrizing both mu and uh, sigma using neural network models, okay? So you have this uh, regression model, uh, suppose mu and sigma are somehow parametrized by neural networks, you can uh, estimate mu and sigma from the data, so you get uh, fitted means and standard deviation functions, mu hat and sigma hat. Uh, now we can do the same sort of thing as before. We can look at the, the fitted mean somehow at s equals s obs. And then instead of, um, we can plug in some empirical residuals here to get an approximate sample for theta given s equals s obs. Okay? So here, uh, let's look at our empirical residuals for eta i. So we look at theta minus the fitted mean divided by the fitted standard deviation. That gives me an empirical residual eta i hat, say. And then um, to get an approximate posterior sample, I can say, well, I'm going to take this regression model seriously. I'm going to look at the fitted mean at the observed s. And then I'm going to add on the fitted standard deviation at the observed s times my empirical residuals. And that gives me an approximate posterior sample. So coming back to that toy example that I had here before, with the nonlinear regression adjustments, uh, you're now allowing this uh, fitted mean uh, curve here to be nonlinear. So we're, we're translating points in a nonlinear way, and we're doing some scaling as well, because in the regression model, we're allowing for the heteroscedasticity of the errors. And in general, you know, the more complex you make the regression adjustment, the less localization you have to do in ABC. So you can get away with a bigger epsilon, a much bigger epsilon, if you use a really fancy regression model like this, this neural network uh, adjustment model. Okay. And the, actually, the, there are approaches. I'm not sure if you'd call them ABC approaches, but there are likelihood free inference approaches that are based just on regression with, with no tolerance, no rejection, no important sampling whatsoever. Okay. So just to show some results of applying that approach in the Nicholson blowflies data set. Um, so I'm showing here the, the results after regression adjustment that's read Local linear adjustment is uh, brown, and no adjustment is black. And so, you know, both the regression adjustments here are, are doing pretty well. Now, you might, looking at this, you might say, well, okay, the linear regress regression adjustment seems to be doing nearly as well as the uh, more sophisticated one. But really here, that's because we used the Fernhead and Prangle summary statistics. So we projected the original summaries down to low dimensions, and, and the summary statistics for the Fernhead and Prangle approach, they are point estimates of the parameters. So we expect them to be reasonably linearly related to the, to the, to the parameters. So you know, because the relationship between the summary statistics and parameters is nearly linear, linear regression adjustment looks quite, quite good here, works quite well. Okay, um, so far I've been talking just about you know, really simple a rejection ABC type algorithms. Um, now we're going to 
move towards talking about some more sophisticated uh, methods. Okay. Uh, first of all, the simple rejection ABC, one way of thinking about it is uh, thinking about you know, what's the joint distribution of the theta and S values that you retain in that algorithm. So um, in the basic rejection ABC, you, you generate theta S pairs from the model, but then you condition on this, that the distance between S and S obs is less than epsilon. So we, in the S and theta space, we're truncating um, the support in this way. And so in the basic rejection ABC, you have this approximation to the posterior. So if, if you're interested in the posterior on theta, so for these theta S samples that you get out of rejection ABC, you then integrate out uh, S, so you get uh, the posterior is proportional to this pr the prior times this. So th this thing here, the, you know, this is like, this is the implicit likelihood approximation that you're using in the rejection ABC. So, um, so what we're doing is we, 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 we would want P of S obs given theta, that's the true likelihood, but what we're doing is we're integrating P of S given theta in, a, in an S ball around S obs, okay? So that gives an approximate likelihood where we're sort of averaging over P of S given theta for S values close to S obs, okay? Okay, so uh, we have this likelihood approximation that we're using here. Now, um, there's no reason really to N not to generalize this to sort of um, the use of a general kernel instead of that indicator term that's appearing in the likelihood approximation. So suppose we have a nice sort of kernel function, K of U. Uh, we're rescaling it like this, so there's a bandwidth epsilon. As epsilon goes to zero, this kernel function is going to become like a point mass on zero. Um, we consider this uh, approximation to the likelihood uh, where we integrate this uh, kernel against the, uh, the, the sampling uh, distribution for S given theta, okay? And um, as I said, it, as epsilon approaches zero, this is gonna become like a point mass on zero. And so this is gonna give all the weight in the integration to, to, to S obs. And this will be, become like P of S obs given theta. Um, now, the posterior approximation you get using that kernel approximation of the likelihood um, is, is this, of course. And, um, you know, just like the, the rejection ABC, you can think of having a, a joint distribution of, on theta and, and a summary statistic replicate S given S obs of this form, and then Integrating out S gives you, gives you that approximation. Okay. Now, the, the, when you use a non... So, the, the basic rejection ABC algorithm I explained before, that is just this, this with a uniform kernel, okay? And the, the basic rejection ABC algorithm that I described before, it can be generalized to this situation of a general kernel without much trouble. Um, so I thought I'd just show you, you know, some examples of the implicit likelihood being used in ABC for two different kernels. So I'm going to go back again to this location normal toy model. Um, so Y is N theta 1, theta is N 0 1. I've got these samples from the joint prior. Um, let me consider here, say, uh, a uniform kernel and a Gaussian kernel. Um, so I've, I've shown you here what the uh, implicit kernel ABC likelihoods are for sort of equivalent values of the bandwidth. Um, so uh, the Gaussian kernel is on the left and the uniform kernel is on the right. Okay, so um, red is the largest bandwidth 
then uh, green is smaller, brown is smaller. Okay, and particularly when you get to small bandwidths, you notice that um, you know the approximations for different kernels they're pretty similar, and you know this is similar to people's experience with kernel density estimation. The, the form of the kernel doesn't matter so much, but the choice of the the bandwidth or the tolerance here is very important. Okay, um, so let me talk about now um, important sampling uh, approaches to ABC. So. Um, So, you know, I, I showed one way you could generalize the simple rejection ABC using a, using a kernel. Um, important sampling, you know, is another way to generalize the, the, the basic ABC algorithm. Okay, so I think for this audience, most people know what important sampling is, but suppose you have some density function F of theta, and for suitable functions H of theta, you want to approximate expectations like this. Um, so f of theta might be a posterior, and then maybe we want to compute or approximate some posterior expectation. Now, let me suppose for the moment that we can compute that there's no unknown normalizing constant in f of theta. Um, suppose I have some proposal or importance density g of theta that's easy to sample from. Then my expectation of interest here, I can write it like this. Uh, by multiplying and dividing by g. Um, and uh, that's now an expectation with respect to this proposal density g, like this. Okay. Um, and then we can approximate our expectations of interest for f. Um, well, th th that's equivalent to, to this expectation with respect to g. And then so I can... Um, if I have a bunch of samples from, uh, from G, I can uh, approximate this thing here uh, just by a, by a sample average. And then um, you can think of this as a sort of finding a, a weighted mean of the, of, the, of the H values at the samples from G. So where the, the weights are, are the F over G terms. Yeah. Um, now, the choice of the proposal density or the importance density, that's important. If, um, you know, if, if, if G is a poor approximation to F, then the variances will have high weights. Oh, sorry. The, the weights will have high variance. Um, if F of theta is unnormalized, you know, you can just scale the weights so that they sum to one. And it's... Now, uh, how does important sampling work for ABC? Well, uh, suppose we want to um, simulate from this, this thing. So, um, so I've got, I, again, I'm using a, a general kernel. Um, if this kernel was uniform, this would be, you know, like the simple rejection ABC again. Um, now, I'm going to try and simulate from this thing using important sampling. Okay? And then, of course, the, the marginal distribution for this in theta is some kind of approximation to the posterior that I'm interested in. Um, so we're going to generate, uh, in order to, to sort of generate weighted samples from this thing, you know, we're, we're going to generate from some proposal density. I've got a proposal for theta and then for my proposal for, for S, given theta, I'm going to use the, the model itself, the, the sampling distribution for S given theta. Okay, so what happens when you do important sampling? What do the importance weights look like? Well, I look at the ratio of uh, this thing here divided by my importance density. And because I use... Um, you use the, 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 the sampling model for S given theta as the proposal for S given theta. Um, the intractable likelihood terms um, in the target density and the, and the proposal, they cancel out, okay? So you've got importance weights now that don't depend on the, 
on any intractable likelihood. So we really have a likelihood-free uh, method based on important sampling. So, um, of course, if you were using a uniform kernel, uh, basically within a ball you have equal weights, whereas outside the ball uh, you would have... Um, oh, so, sorry, if, if you use G, G the prior and if you have a uniform kernel, then you'd have uniform weights on the accepted samples and zero weights um, outside. Yeah. So with a compact kernel, you can choose the bandwidth so that a certain fraction of prior samples receive positive weight. So this is similar to adaptive choices of the tolerance in the rejection ABC. Yeah. Um, so as well as important sampling for ABC, you can do Markov chain Monte Carlo as well. So let me explain how that works. So, so well, first of all, uh, I think most people here know what MCMC -MC is. So you, you, you want to simulate a Markov chain on the parameter space, which has the stationary distribution being the posterior distribution of interest. And of course, you want to have a Markov chain where the simulation of the Markov chain is easy, can be done. Um, so you, you run the chain and then after convergence you keep the samples and then you've got a dependent sample from the posterior that you can use to generate summaries of the posterior. And the common way of doing business with Markov chain Monte Carlo is to use the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, or, although of course there are other um, alternatives increasingly being explored these days. Um, so the idea of uh, the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is that you, you generate a proposal value from some proposal and you accept it with some probability. Um, this probability is depending on a prior ratio and a likelihood ratio and a proposal ratio. Okay, and this, this acceptance probability is contrived in such a way that you, know, you get the, the stationary distribution being the posterior distribution of interest. And if your proposed value isn't accepted, you just stay at the current value. Now, um, can we do MCMC for ABC, where we can't compute the likelihood? Uh, yes, we can. And the idea is similar to the one that I sketched in the case of important sampling. OK, so again, suppose I want to um, draw samples from this distribution, say, proportional to this. Um, the choice of proposal here is important to, uh, to get rid of the intractable likelihood. So suppose I'm doing Metropolis Hastings, I have a proposal density, I've got some proposal density on theta, so it generates a proposal theta prime, possibly dependent on the current theta, and then I generate a proposed S from the from the sampling model for S. Okay. So I can simulate from the model, so I can generate from that thing, right? And then if you look at the Metropolis Hastings acceptance probability, you've got this sort of prior times likelihood ratio over here and a proposal ratio. And again, the intractable likelihood terms, they, they cancel out in the acceptance probability. Okay. So you can you can obtain a, a likelihood free uh, MCMC algorithm in a reasonably straightforward way. Um, it's worth noting a few difficulties with the basic ABC MCMC. Um, it, it can be hard to move if you're in the tails of the posterior. That's because the summary statistics might be hard to match there. And if you're moving locally, um, that can be a problem. You can get stuck in the tails for a long time. Um, it can also be hard to calibrate the tolerance, the value of epsilon. And um, in the MCMC algorithm, you know, the, the tolerance epsilon, it determines how well the chain mixes as well as the accuracy. Okay. Um, now, there are more advanced ABC MCMC methods available that mitigate those problems to some extent. Let me explain, you know, one sort of more advanced uh, MCMC ABC method. So this is uh, described in this paper. Uh, what they suggest doing is applying ABC MC, oops, 
they suggest applying ABC MCMC with a fairly large tolerance to ensure good mixing, then from the samples you get, they extract a subset for which the simulated summaries are closest to the observed values. Then they apply regression adjustments. And this paper, it also suggested using uh, partial least squares dimension reduction for the summaries. Um, <coughs> so this is an ABC MCMC method that's uh, readily available actually in standard software. Um, some other you know, ABC MCMC algorithms that are kind of interesting. Um, in this paper, the authors suggest actually making the tolerance epsilon random, so, and they include epsilon as an additional variable in the target distribution. They do that in such a way that the marginal for theta is still the, the thing of interest. Uh, and then people have considered other things like parallel tempering, which is a natural idea. If, if the mixing depends on epsilon, you know, why don't you have a, a sequence of target distributions with different epsilon? For big epsilon, you can make big steps in the, in the space, and then those values can be swapped down into lower temperatures. Um, so that probably doesn't mean much if you don't know what parallel tempering is, but that's, that's one uh, way to make, to get around the, the problems with mixing of ABC, MCMC methods. So here's just some results for that uh, uh, Ricker model again, um, illustrating the, the, MCMC, the, the MCMC approach of uh, Wigman et al. So what I did here, I think, is I generated 100,000 prior samples uh, in a pilot run. I uh, kept maybe the best 1%. I used that tolerance, which is pretty loose. Um, in the ABC MCMC, and then in the ABC MCMC, you uh, you don't keep all the theta samples. You retain only some of them, those which are closest in distance in terms of the summary statistics to the observed values. And then we also applied regression adjustments afterwards, and that gives the uh, result here. Where um, so the raw MCMC output is is the the brown, and the green shows you what what effect the subsetting and regression adjustment has. So there's actually a, a, a real improvement in the approximation from applying the subsetting and adjustment. Um, now, one way to think of um, ABC MCMC algorithms is in terms of uh, what are called pseudo marginal Metropolis Hastings algorithms. Um, uh, I'm probably talking to an audience of experts on this here. Um, so, you know, suppose um, we have a parameter theta and observed data by OBS. Suppose we have a Metropolis Hastings algorithm with a proposal, G of theta prime given theta. Suppose that uh, computing the likelihood is not easy, but we can get an unbiased estimate of the likelihood, okay? Uh, so this is the Metropolis Hastings acceptance probability. Suppose I just replace the unknown likelihood with um, a non-negative unbiased estimate of it. Now surprisingly that modified algorithm is actually exact. And you can think of the ABC MCMC algorithm that I described before as an example of pseudo marginal Metropolis Hastings. So why is that so? So this was the um, sort of implicit likelihood I was using uh, before, okay? And um, obviously this, you know, if, if I, um, well, this, this likelihood, it's an expectation, right? It's an expectation with respect to this, this guy here. And so I could, I could estimate this uh, integral by Monte Carlo. So um, I could even just generate a single sample S from this, plug it in here, and that would give me a non-negative unbiased estimate of the posterior, at least if the kernel was uh, everywhere positive. Okay, 
Um, and of course, you know, I could average over more than one draw from the, uh, for the summary statistics here. But, but one draw is recommended. Um, now, this was my ABC MCMC acceptance probability before. So what you can see is really this has the form of um, the pseudo-marginal type uh, acceptance probability. So um, if I just replace this, this likelihood estimate by my, my unbiased non-negative likelihood estimate here, I, I get exactly the same. Uh, yeah. Um, well, of course, one draw is recommended based on uh, the computational uh, statistical trade-off. I mean, obviously, if you use more than one sample to estimate the likelihood, then that would reduce the variance. And, of course, people who are familiar with pseudo-marginal metropolis hastings know that the mixing can be really bad unless you control the variance of the log likelihood estimate carefully. Um, there, there's some theory in that paper um, by... Which paper is that? There's some theory in this paper about, uh, you know, why exactly one sample is recommended. Um, I don't really have a very good intuitive answer about that at the moment. It's a long time since I read that paper. But, but yeah, I, I think if you, if you read that paper, that would give you the answer you want. Yeah. You're saying basically better with your computational you know, files? Right. I mean, if you, if you only use one sample, in some sense you get poorer mixing in the MCMC. But, of course, you can take more iterations with the same computational budget. And based on that kind of trade-off, they that they have some results about why it's best to use a single sample. Yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so that's sort of important sampling, basic important sampling in MCMC. Um, a, a, an attractive alternative to MCMC in the ABC context is to use an SMC sampler. Um, it has the, the usual advantages. You've got easy adaptive design of proposals. Um, if you have a posterior that's highly irregular and multimodal, um, it can work in that situation when MCMC may not. And there's a very natural way in a, a SMC sampler to design a sequence of target distributions here. Um, you can consider a sequence of tolerances starting at some large value and going to a small one. And now I'm not going to describe uh, SMC samplers in great detail. We have uh, many experts in the audience, particularly AJ, I would say. And, um, but the idea is you consider a sequence of targets and then you've got a population of weighted particles uh, being maintained, and you traverse the tolerances sequentially, starting from large to small. And through a combination of reweighting and resampling and uh, ABC MCMC type moves, you can uh, decide, design a, a very efficient and automated kind of sampler. Okay. Um, now, I've talked a bit about um, synthetic likelihood. Um, earlier, because I, I talked about uh, some examples from Simon Wood's paper. I want to talk about synthetic likelihood now as an alternative to, to ABC methods, okay? Um, so, you know, we've sort of seen that there's a curse of dimensionality inherent in ABC methods. You can't really deal with summary statistics that are too high dimensional. That also means that you can't deal with models where you have a high dimensional parameter. And you know, the ABC likelihood, it, it's effectively based on some sort of kernel estimation of the summary statistic distribution, and, you know, that, that becomes impractical in high dimensions. So an alternative likelihood-free methodology is something called synthetic likelihood, 
Um, this is making some pretty aggressive approximations too, um, but it is a technique that, that seems to scale better to high dimensions in terms of the parameter, and it's also pretty tolerant of um, irrelevant summaries, so you can have a fairly high dimensional summary statistic as well. And um, another advantage of synthetic likelihood is that you know, its tuning parameters are easy to set. With ABC, you have that tolerance that you have to choose. That's a parameter that's tuning parameter that's hard to set. And the idea behind synthetic likelihood is very simple. Um, you're going to approximate um, the intractable summary statistic sampling distribution as being normally distributed. Uh, that may sound outrageous at the moment, but let me explain why that's not so so terrible. And so once we approximate um, P of S given theta as being uh, normal, we can estimate the, the mean and the covariance in that um, approximate sampling distribution based on simulation. So um, at each value of theta for which you want to approximate the likelihood, you simulate some summary statistic uh, replicates from the, the model for the summary statistics and then I have a estimated mean for S given theta based on the simulations and estimated covariance for S given theta based on the simulations. Then I can plug in the mean and the covariance matrix into a normal density and then if I evaluate that normal density at the observed S, that's a kind of approximate likelihood based on a working normal model where I approximate the mean and the covariance by simulation. Now, what are some of the advantages of synthetic likelihood compared to ABC? Well, you can deal with high dimensional uh, summary statistics much better because, well, you're making parametric approximations rather than using some sort of kernel approximation to the likelihood. Um, there's a tuning parameter you have to choose in the synthetic likelihood. That's how many simulations you choose um, for each likelihood approximation. But that tuning parameter is actually pretty easy to set. It's not hard to set, like the tolerance in ABC. So, um, so it, it's found in practice that the, the synthetic likelihood posterior, it, it's not very sensitive to how you choose N. You can choose that to be quite small and the, the result is not that different to what you get when n is large. Um, what, what does matter about the choice of n, though, is if you have a small n, the, if you're using, say, MCMC, the mixing can be very slow. So the choice of n is usually based more on computational reasons than on uh, statistical reasons. So statistically, it doesn't seem to matter very much what, what n you use, but for computation it can matter, but you can... You know, there's ways to choose n reasonably. Um, on the other hand, you're assuming normality for the summary statistics. So, well, um, that's not quite so uh, crazy as it sounds. Uh, very often you can choose the summaries so they satisfy some central limit theorem, so normal approximations are reasonable. For example, one common approach to choosing summary statistics is to choose... Uh, is to, to fit an auxiliary model, so some, some other model with a tractable likelihood. And, you know, say you get the maximum likelihood estimates from an auxiliary model, well, if you fit a misspecified model, uh, you look at the MLE in a misspecified model, that's uh, normal under pretty general conditions. So if you're choosing summary statistics based on auxiliary models, which is one common way to do it, um, you know, this normal assumption can be reasonable. Um, even if the summary statistics aren't normal, you can sort of empirically estimate transformations to normality. Um, in practice, you know, this is involving just looking at marginal transformations of one parameter at a time. That's not really adequate for ensuring joint normality, of course. Um, and uh, empirically, at least, it's found that the synthetic likelihood-based posterior is often not sensitive to violations of normality. 
Um, so as I said, you know, the, in synthetic likelihood, if you use synthetic likelihood within MCMC, the uh, targeted distribution doesn't seem to depend very strongly on n. Um, if you really knew that the, the s given theta distribution was exactly normal, there, there is in fact um, you know, a way of unbiasedly estimating um, you know, the, the, the likelihood term. And so then you know, this is in the case of s given theta being exactly normal, this is a kind of pseudo marginal algorithm. Um, of course, uh, you can do other things in high dimensions, like in high dimensions it's beneficial to estimate the covariance in the synthetic likelihood using, um, you know, shrinkage or something like that. Um, so in this paper we look at uh, using graphical lasso. Uh, there's also experiments with using the bootstrap method for computationally expensive models. So if there's a computationally expensive model, but it's, say, a stationary time series model or a model with IOD data or something like that, then you can estimate the covariance just based on one simulation or even less than one simulation you know, using the bootstrap. Okay. Um, and there's also variational inference methods with the synthetic likelihood. And the advantage of these methods is that they're much less sensitive to noise in the likelihood estimates. So um, in high dimensions, you might need a very large N to get adequate uh, mixing in, say, MCMC. But um, variational methods can work even with very, very noisy estimates of the likelihood. Um, here again, this is looking at synthetic likelihood compared to the ABC estimated marginals with neural network regression adjustment. Um, so the synthetic likelihood just uses all 23 summary statistics. So it, it copes really well with high dimensional summary statistics. Um, one point about the synthetic likelihood that I think I made before was that, um, so I, I said that the synthetic likelihood posterior, it's not very sensitive to what you use for n, how many simulations per likelihood estimate you use, um, but the mixing of MCMC chains can be very much dependent on the choice of n. So if you have a very noisy likelihood estimate, that's not good for, um, it's similar to pseudo-marginal metropolis Hastings algorithms, that's not good for the mixing. So here I've got a, a synthetic likelihood MCMC chain with a certain random walk proposal for n equals 1,000, so that mixes reasonably well. If I go down to n equals 250 in this example, um, you can see I'm getting stuck for long periods of time. And if I made n smaller still, that would be even worse. So you say n here? I'm sorry? N, here? n is the number of simulations that is used to approximate the likelihood at each point. Yeah. So if n is small, what it means is that your estimated likelihood is very noisy. Yeah, and that high variance in the likelihood estimate, it it causes slow mixing in the chain, so, yeah. Is the dimensionality of the summary statistic again six? Um, I'm sorry, again? The dimensionality of the summary statistic. Yep. Is it again six in this? Uh, no, for, for the synthetic, this is 23, 23, yeah. So you don't have to project in the way that you do with ABC, yeah. Now, um, okay, um, so, you know, I'm quite fond of this uh, approach, although it has strengths and weaknesses, of course. But um, one thing that bothers people about synthetic likelihood, as you might imagine, is the normal approximation. But there's, you know, a lot of extensions that people have considered recently about how you might uh, address non-normality. Okay. Um, and there are sort of related methods to synthetic likelihood in the, in the literature. Um, where people use, you know, the synthetic likelihood uses a working normal likelihood, but you can use an empirical likelihood, a bootstrap likelihood, or, or other parametric approximations um, that, are, that are richer than, than normal, yeah. Okay. Uh,
How long have we got? Five minutes. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll just try and explain this one more, one more thing. So, um, you know, I've talked about, you know, important sampling and MCMC for uh, constructing posterior approximations in the likelihood-free context, uh, but there's another approach to doing approximate Bayesian computations that's increasingly popular. Uh, this is using uh, variational approximations. So I want to talk about how you do um, variational approximations in the likelihood-free inference literature. And I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of uh, recent activity in the machine learning community about devising uh, uh, methods for likelihood-free inference, um, uh, mostly based on variational kind of methods, but not, not, not always. Okay, so with variational approximation, um, what we're going to do is we're going to consider some sort of measure of the quality of uh, an approximation to the posterior. Um, here we're going to use the callback leibler divergence. Okay, and the callback leibler divergence here between the true posterior and an approximation q lambda theta, it can be written like this. So q lambda theta here, that's our approximation. Uh, the lambda, um, it, it's, a, it's a parameter that indexes different members of the approximating family. And so what we want to do in variational approximation is we want to choose the value of lambda such that you get the optimal approximation in the sense of this measure of closeness here. That's the callback Leibler divergence. So um, if you look at this um, thing that we want to minimize here, uh, the first term doesn't depend on lambda. So we really just need to deal with this second term here. Um, this thing is called the variational lower bound. So we want to minimize in this callback Leibler divergence is equivalent to maximizing this variational lower bound. So I'm going to write the variational lower bound as just L of lambda. It's a function of the variational parameters that we want to optimize over lambda. Okay, so we want to maximize the lower bound. That's equivalent to minimizing the callback Leibler divergence. Now, uh, can variational approximation be used for ABC? Yes, it can. Um, so Suppose we can estimate the likelihood unbiasedly. So we saw earlier that we could do that for ABC. So I suppose we have some non-negative estimator, um, p hat y obs given theta. Let's define z in this way. It's the difference between the log uh, estimated likelihood minus the true log likelihood. Um, so e to the z is this, this ratio of p hat y obs given theta divided by p of y obs given theta. So z is this variable that in some sense encapsulates all the randomness that's going into the likelihood estimate. Um, now I'm just going to write pi of theta for the posterior distribution to save notation. Let's consider a, a joint distribution on theta and z of, of this. Um, and here, um, g of z given theta, that's um, defined implicitly just by the process of generating um, your likelihood estimate, okay? And um, so th this idea of, you know, including z into the, the target distribution, it's similar to the idea that's used to justify pseudo-marginal metropolis Hastings algorithms. So for that uh, target there, um, what's the theta marginal? Well, it's, it's pi of theta, actually, the, the true posterior, okay? So if you integrate here over z, uh, e to the z is that, as I said before. And um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the only things that depend on z here are uh, th th this one and this one. So, so, you know, we said that p hat y given theta was an unbiased estimate. Um, so what we hear, wh when you do this integral, you get p of y given theta divided by p of y given theta, that's one, yeah. 
Now let's also, in our variational distribution, let's expand that to include z as well. So that's q lambda theta times g of z given theta. Okay. So in this, um, just, just think of q lambda theta as a multivariate normal, say, approximation. Now, um, the theta marginal of that um, variational distribution, it's q lambda theta, obviously. And uh, it turns out that if you can tune your unbiased likelihood estimator in such a way that the uh, expected value of z given theta, that's, that's like the error in the log likelihood estimate, does not depend on theta, then the variational optimization that matches this augmented variational distribution to that augmented target is equivalent to the one matching this guy to this guy. Okay. So if you have an unbiased likelihood estimate and if you can, uh, say, adapt the number of samples you use to estimate the likelihood with theta in such a way that the variance doesn't depend on theta, then um, we can replace the original variational problem with, with this one. And it's, it's equivalent. Um, now, you can actually estimate the gradient of the lower bound in that optimization problem where you've included z in the, in, in the target and the approximating distribution. So you can use stochastic gradient optimization methods for doing likelihood free inference here. And, you know, you don't need to be able to compute the likelihood um, in that variational optimization. Um, so there's been various refinements of this technique uh, more recently uh, as well. These methods can be uh, applied also with the synthetic likelihood. Um, I think there's probably a good place to skip towards the, the end. I wanted to describe a method called expectation propagation ABC, which is a, uh, a method related to variational approximation methods. Uh, it's considered in, in this paper. I'll skip that uh, because of the time. So um, this has been an introduction to ABC. Of course, uh, time is short and I've neglected some things. I haven't talked much about ABC theory. Um, there's a paper by Fraser et al. that's to appear in Biometrica that gives a pretty comprehensive um, overview of the state of the art there. Um, a topic I haven't discussed at all is ABC model choice. Uh, there's a book chapter in the recent handbook of ABC that, that uh, deals with that, that's very informative, a very up-to-date uh, survey. Um, there are various methods that are specialised for computationally expensive models, um, Bayesian optimization kind of methods um, which use emulators, um, methods that use early rejection somehow, um, and so on. So that's a very interesting area of research. Um, as I said, when I talked about regression adjustments, there are approaches in the literature to likelihood free inference that just use regression. They don't use the ABC idea of any kind of rejection uh, sampling. Uh, so people use methods based on uh, kernels, uh, random forest, deep learning mixtures. Um, for high dimensions, there's some other methods that um, that, that make sort of even more aggressive approximations, I suppose, to extend to high dimensions. Uh, methods based on marginal adjustments and also uh, co copulas, where you can, you know, if you make certain approximations, you can infer a joint distribution from low dimensional marginals if the, uh, the distribution has a certain form. Uh, I thought I'd mention what sort of software is available. Uh, I think I'll just talk, I'll just talk about the, the software I used to generate the examples in the talk. So I used uh, AB, the ABC package in R, ABC tools, uh, EB, e Easy ABC and the, the sin -like, uh, synthetic likelihood package. So that's, that's all I want to say. So thank you for listening. I hope the talk wasn't too elementary for this audience and uh, happy to uh, answer any questions.
Yeah. Yeah, actually, for the for the Nicholson's blowfly example, um, you probably can get the exact posterior. Um, I think, but not easily at all. Okay, so it's one of these chaotic models where uh, the state estimation is quite difficult. Um, and but Simon Woody has a paper in Statistical Science a few years ago, and he's sort of comparing synthetic likelihood to pseudo-marginal Metropolis Hastings and other methods for, for dealing with these sorts of models, these near chaotic models. And, uh, you know, so, and I think probably in, in, in that paper, he, I think he does a comparison between synthetic likelihood and, 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 the, and the true posterior from, a, from one of these you know, uh, pseudo-marginal type of approaches. Yeah. Um, but the, the, th the reason he favours um, these um, likelihood free inference methods where you, you use summary statistics to throw away information is because um, the likelihood becomes, when you have this near chaotic model and there's not much noise in the state equation, the, the likelihood can become very irregular, highly multimodal. And so it's quite difficult to do the usual things. Um, when you say I'm losing something, you so mean... Uh, assumption that the, the noise has to, ah, yes, yes. Has to be independent across right. the data. Yes, yes. normally assumed in the pseudo-marginal kind of analysis, but you don't actually need that for the method to be valid. Right, right that's right. So it, you need it for a theoretical analysis, I guess, but not for... Ah, so for the method, for the BB to be valid, you don't you, need yeah, that Yeah, you need it, you need you it. Need yes, it. you do need so it. So why, why is that actually? Why is that um, you know, for, for using stochastic gradient optimization, you need unbiased estimates of the likelihood. And uh, in this case, the log likelihood or just the, the likelihood? The log likelihood. Yeah, sorry, yes, the log likelihood. I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah. That's the issue. yeah, yeah, right, sure. And, and actually, it's also that um, you, you want, in order to make the optimization problems equivalent, actually, you, you need this, yeah. Um, so if you look at the, for, for the variational uh, problem where you include Z, um, you can write down the lower bound, and it's like the, the lower bound for the problem without Z plus another term. And then that other, that other term doesn't depend on lambda if you make that assumption. Right. That, that's, the, yeah, that, that's, that's the reason, yeah. Okay, so that's concluding. Yeah, thanks very much again, David. Thank you.